Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jesse the Plants. We love bringing you new videos every week. And I know you enjoy watching them. So like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell so you will know when new content is posted. Like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Now sit back and watch this. We're going to continue with part two of the parables of Jesus. Hallelujah. How many people were here last Wednesday night? Can I see hands around the room? Wonderful. Well, uh, we're so excited about this new series that the Lord led me to start. And it's all about the parables of Jesus. And You know, about one third of Jesus' teaching was parables. Those of you who were here last week, I'm going to give a little bit of a review to just go forward, but continue on in this. But during this, all these parables really were brief stories from everyday life told to illustrate spiritual truths. So a lot of us have heard about Jesus' parables, and we've read Jesus' parables, but we're going to study them and see what they really meant, and that's what we've kind of started on that last week. But uh, I told you that this all began during the second year of Jesus' ministry, and he made a dramatic shift in the way that he communicated when speaking in public. Up until that time, y'all know that he often would just tell uh, stories. He would teach a Bible, uh, teach kingdom principles, uh, like the, the Sermon on the Mount was covered in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, told them a lot of practical things and taught them straightforward things and examples as well. There was an example at the end of Matthew 7, which he talked about the person that builds their, their life on the sand as opposed to the person that builds their life on the rock. That really wasn't a parable. That was an illustration. Parables were a little different, and we've been talked a little bit about that. This, uh, it's a different way because he shifted the way he communicated because the tide changed. The people started rejecting him. They wanted to, cru to kill him even then. They were, uh, unbelief had set in. Their hearts were hardened. Uh, those hardened hearts of the, of the religious leaders caused him to shift the way he taught. You know, I was just thinking about how important it is that when you do teach, that you uh, hope, I think part of the reason he shifted this was to hide some truths we talked about this last week from those that didn't believe, but also to help others go deeper. Because when you, uh, when you ask questions or you, you pose things a little differently, it, it causes people to think deeply instead of just telling them stuff. For example, when he was talking to his disciples and he was at Caesarea Philippi, he said, uh, uh, who do men say that I am? Instead of just asking them, who do you think I am? First he had that, so they started that discussion. So he often, when they would ask him something, he would answer with a question because his purpose was to get them to start thinking for themselves. You know, parents understand this. You want your kids to start thinking for themselves. Well, what would you do if you did this? I know where my granddaughter is 15, and next year, 16, she'll be able to drive. Well, she doesn't know how to drive. So every time we're in the car... We're giving her examples and scenarios and things to do. You know, Meredith, if uh, I could say we were, just was just a couple of weeks ago, she and I went shopping after lunch because she wanted some things at that um, Ulta. She loves, she's really into bath stuff. She loves scrubs. She's a very clean little girl. <laughs> Always scrubbing, smelling, pretty, pretty smells. She really likes that. And uh, so anyway, she wanted to go. Her mom didn't want to go. She said, that'd be something you could do with Mimi. I said, yes, I love doing that. So we went, and it was sort of rainy on that day. And so we were on um, Williams Boulevard, about to turn onto Airline. And it was a big intersection there. And, uh, and it was, I could have made, the light turned yellow, and I could have gone through, but um, it was rainy. Also, there were other cars waiting at the other intersection. So I told her, I said, now, Meredith, had this been a really sunny day, and if no cars were in those other intersections waiting for me, I might have pushed it through and went real fast, because yellow, it's okay to go. But because it's <laughs> raining, and because other cars sometimes anticipate going through that light, you know, I'll use that as an example to teach her. And so this is kind of 
the principle, parents do this all the time. Well, Jesus was doing this with his disciples too. When they were walking along, you know, he saw certain things and he used those as practical examples to teach them kingdom truths, to help them because he knew he wouldn't be with them forever. They didn't realize that at the time, even though he told them, right? But he was always teaching them. And you know what? He's, he's still doing that. He's still teaching us and helping us to grow and to learn. But this is what the parables were. The parables were a way to help them to get to a place where they start thinking for themselves. Because I know there'd be a time when Meredith's in a car, she's going to have to think for herself. And I want her to remember, Mimi said, oh, it's raining, I shouldn't do that. I could probably do it on a sunny day because it's legal to cross, to, tr to go through the intersection and turn on a yellow, but it's not smart if it's rainy and if other cars, if there's a lot of other cars in the area. Right? So it's all about not control. It's about safety, protection. It's wisdom. And so these are the kinds of things that we want to hear from the Lord today. We want him to show us and teach us. Don't go that way, Kathy. Wait right here, Kathy. Don't go there. Take your time. Don't say that. You don't want to really say that. Because remember when you said that that other time? You didn't. At first you liked that you said it, but then you, took, you said, oh, I shouldn't have said it. So the Holy Spirit will remind us and teach us and train us along the way. But parables are a different type of a way of teaching and that Jesus, he wasn't the only one that did it. The, the sages, the uh, uh, rabbis, they taught through that. There's different places that they have parables in the Old Testament. Uh, a good example of a parable in the Old Testament is Nathan the prophet when he came to David after David had uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and had his, her husband Uriah killed, put the front of the battle so that he would die uh, because his wife Bathsheba was pregnant with, his, with King David's child. And so Nathan comes in there, starts telling him a story about this little uh, man who owned one little sheep, you know, and, and uh, this other man who owned a whole bunch of them, and he went after this man's one sheep. So he's taught, this was a parable which made David think, and so, he, and so when, when he came down to the point of the story about how, what should we do, so David says, kill him. He says, you're the man. So uh, there were examples in the Old Testament that you can find about those were really parables. It made people think. And so Jesus did this. Sometimes he explained them. Sometimes he didn't. We're going to see some here in this chapter to show you some that he explained and some that he didn't. And um, I've heard it said that when the Bible doesn't say much about something, we shouldn't either. <laughs> because then you start getting off into the wrong, into the weeds, you know, and, and although it's good to speculate, don't preach it as gospel. You know, you have to, it's good to think, but you got to just make sure you still stay on the right road. You want to get off on that little dirt road somewhere, you don't know where it ends up. So that's a good bit of advice. This word parable comes from two Greek words, para, and it's a prefix that refers to something that is alongside something else. For instance, paralegals work alongside lawyers as helpers. So I think most of us understand this. This word balo means to throw or to hurl. So a parable means something that is thrown alongside something else. In order to illustrate a truth that he's teaching, Jesus throws a parable along a truth that he wanted them to get. And here in chapter 13 was a perfect example of what he did. Purpose of parables was to make spiritual truths clearer to the hearers, number one. Number two, a parable's purpose was to put truth in a form that is easier to be remembered. And then uh, a third point, I mentioned this last week, is to avoid offense with hostile people who would not receive the truth. Because yes. they already wanted to kill him. So if he'd said even more, sometimes it went over their heads. You ever did that? When you're talking to people, you went, whoop, because you know it's went right over their heads. He wanted it to go right over their heads, some of them, because he knew where they were. But he knew that it would, he was speaking, and you know it, when someone is preaching, and they're speak, preaching spirit to spirit. You know when you have that connection and it's, it's you, you, your spirit is being fed and the Holy Spirit is doing something and it's unique, even if you don't understand it. So Jesus, many times in the parables, even though they didn't comprehend it with their head, he was imparting something into their spirit that would, they could draw upon later on 
after he was gone. And he recalled and they remembered and after he was crucified and rose from the dead, they, they would remember things that he said But because he, when he was telling them back in those days where they walked together, he uh, was speaking spirit to spirit. And I love that. Amen? Amen. So the purpose of parables, number three, was to avoid offense with hostile people who would not receive the truth. And the fourth purpose was to declare judgment upon those who were willfully blind. They will not be able to stand before the throne of heaven and say they didn't know. God, they made sure, God makes sure that people know. The scriptures tell us, even in the book of Romans, I'm not going to go right to it. I could find it if I needed to. But it, go, it says how just the things even of nature testify that God is God. I love to read Psalms 19 because Psalms 19 talks about the ways that God speaks. Well, he speaks in the creation and everything, the heavens speak. And even though the voice is not heard, it says, but it speaks. Then it starts talking about in verse 7 how the word of God is perfect. It, and it transforms, it revives the soul, it says. So are you looking for revival? The word of God will bring you revival. It will revive your soul. Because that's what you need. And you know, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. We're spirit beings, but we, our soul needs to be revived from time to time. Because we get caught up in the, in the weeds and the muck and different things. So it's important to know that. Jesus taught his disciples using cryptic language of parables to move them beyond intellectual abilities and engage their spirit. If the listener had a hunger to learn with an open, teachable heart, then Jesus' words brought life and understanding. It's so true. And you know that when you speak to somebody who really is maybe uh, ignorant to the things of God, maybe they're just um, hardened, but when you speak, when you speak, it doesn't mean about how long they've known the Lord, because there are some that have just got born again the day before, man, they're like, they're like, give me that steak, you know. They're, they're hungry, and, and they're, they're grabbing hold of it, but that's because their heart is pliable. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. We must always be among those who push aside our opinions and traditions to try to get the deepest meaning about what Jesus is really teaching. Amen. So we're already at Matthew chapter 13. So Matthew chapter 13 records a total of eight parables by Jesus. At first when I was studying this, I thought it was seven. Then I realized that there's one right there at the end. They're kind of bookend with the phrase, Jesus taught parables. And then he says, this is how all he did was teach parables. So we're going to see this in our, chat, in our study today. Only four of these parables were spoken to the mixed multitude or to the crowd. And the other four were told only to the disciples. Some of them him, he explained. Last week, we read the first one. Do y'all remember what it was? The parable of the sower. And we learned this parable that this is the key to understanding all of the parables, right? Uh, we're just going to review them. We're not going to read the whole verse. We read, read the whole chapter all the way through verse 23, I think. But I'm just going to review a little bit about, about that right now. Because that's this, because he said this parable is the key, I think it's worth repeating some of the principles that we learned. These four uh, types represent four different heart responses to God's message. Uh, the wayside people. You remember the wayside? When the seed was flown? You know, this is how they, they sowed when they planted. This was an agricultural society. They would just throw it. They didn't have neat rows like we have today. You know, when you fly over something, over an area, you could see those really neat squares and all. They, just, they didn't have it quite that way. So they would fling this seed out, and some of it would fall on the wayside or the hardened path. And because that path was so hard, the, the, the seed really didn't go into the soft soil. It wasn't so that this represented people that hear the word of God but do not understand it. And then the wicked one, the fowls or well, the birds of the air, catch away the seed that is sown in the heart. That was the first type. So, because there were four different types of soils we studied last week. We didn't go into a whole lot of detail about it, but uh, just a quick review. Second was the stony places. Those are people who hear the word and receive it with joy, but have no root, or it says not, not much earth. 
And then, so because they were offended by tribulation or persecution, they really just couldn't take the heat. That's what that meant. Because he said the sun would come up and they were scorched and they withered away. Sometimes when people hear the word, no matter what the subject is, no matter what the sermon is, it, it, it falls, the way we say it, it falls on deaf ears. They, they can't grab it, and it's like over their head. And others, you know, they, they get it, they get it for a moment. The stony places, they receive it with joy, but they don't have any root. They don't stick with it. They don't let it get deep. It's just surface uh, relationship with God and the Word of God. And because of that, they get a little bit of trouble comes, a little bit of uh, persecution comes. They, they, they can't take the heat. So they wither away. Third type is the thorn people. Those thorn people hear the word of God, but they're unfruitful. Why? Because the cares of the world, this world and the deceitfulness of riches, spring up and choke the word that was sown in their heart. So there, that was three unproductive types of people or soils. The fourth one is the one we all want to be. This is what the Wednesday night crowd's all about. Amen. <laughs> That's the good ground, people that hear the word and understand it, and they bring forth fruit, some hundredfold, some 60, some 30. We read those in the scriptures last week. And all five, four are types of hearts that receive the seed, but only one produced the harvest on the seed that was sown. So the condition of our heart really determines the effectiveness of our life. Right. Say that, the condition of my heart will determine my effectiveness in life. I wrote a book years ago, a little tiny mini book. It's my first, first book. I think uh, y'all translated it into Spanish for me. I mean, Keeping a Clean Heart was the name of it, a little mini book. And it talked about, I think, if I can remember it, it was a sermon I preached probably 40 years ago. Anyway, it was um, eliminate, no, examine. Got to examine your heart. What's in there? Uh, eliminate, I think was eliminate what's there that shouldn't be there. It was another E word. I can't quite remember it. Examine, eliminate, and I'll have to look it up. Examine, eliminate is another E word. But anyway, it had to do with maintaining your own heart. And it was, I think it quoted a, a scripture from the Song of Solomon where it was the text where it says, my own vineyard have I not kept. And so it's important that we realize that we're responsible for taking care of our own heart. And uh, although we can try to blame it on everybody and make excuses for everything, but ultimately we are the captain of our ship and responsible for our own growth and our own life. And until you take ownership of that, you're really not going to experience the, the effectiveness or the growth in your life that you really need. And so when we come to that honesty, Jesse and I were talking just recently about uh, certain relationships that we've had over the years and how, uh, you know, Jesse and I, have, people often say we're really transparent. You probably see more than you want to see. <laughs> but we're very transparent <clears throat> and honest. We try to be in our relationships when we talk to people. But sometimes when we're talking to some people, we can tell that they're holding back. And you think that they're thinking the same way you are, then later on you find out, oh, they they're not. They're just telling me what they think I want to hear. And uh, so, and, and that's when I realized, I said, well, then it really wasn't an honest relationship. And because of that, they drift away. They fall away. You can't stay together. You may walk together for a while, but you fall away. The Bible tells us, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? So um, the truth is that that relationship is especially important when you're thinking about your relationship with the Lord. You have to be so brutally honest with him and pure before him and just bear your whole heart. Examine it and show him, let him show you what needs to be cleaned up and then eliminate it. And then enforce, that was the E, the last E, enforce the word of God in your life. So um, it's really practical to learn this way. And these are the things that help us to grow. So um, these four types of people received the seed, but only one produced it. Uh, we must all be open to receive and respond to God's word. Amen. Amen. 
We must be faithful hearers, listeners, and obedient doers of the word. We talked about how here, Jesus often said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. You know, we all have ears. But it's not talking about just hearing. It's talking about listening and obeying, right? This is the way that we bear fruit and bring forth this hundredfold harvest. So often we talked about hundredfold in this church regarding finances, and that is available. But it'll work on every level. You can have a tremendous increase of wisdom. Finances, of course, is, is available. So, because it's in the if it's in the Word, whatever truth and promise that you're believing for in the Word, the same principle will apply. It'll work across the board. So it just depends what we will will read. So these next six parables in this Matthew, we may not cover all of them tonight. Uh, I'm not going to rush through it because it's so good. Uh, begin with the phrase, "The kingdom of heaven is like." Or likened. So Jesus starts to teach his disciples at this point, beginning in verse 24, six different things about how the kingdom of heaven is like this. So it's because he wants to teach them what it's like. Now, in the book, Gospel of Matthew, it is the only place that you will find the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the other gospels, Matt, Mark, Luke, and John, refer to it as the kingdom of God, pretty much meaning the same thing. They just use the different terminology. But some have said the kingdom of heaven is a, is a method, is a place, and the kingdom of God is a method. So it's all pretty much connected anyway. Let's read Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. We're going to look at this second parable called the tares. <clears throat> 24, uh, I'm reading the King James Bible, verse 24. And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, thou, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat in my born. This is parable number two, the tares. This weed, also known as the bearded darnel, is a species of ryegrass that closely resembles wheat in its younger stages. And when, and when it grows, its roots intertwine with the wheat and it make it difficult to uproot it without losing the grain. And its seeds... Uh, are such a strong poison, that, and it grows plentifully in Syria and Palestine. And it was common uh, in the East for enemies to sow tares or other poisonous types of seeds in fields of those they wanted to hurt. If a rival farmer wanted to hamstring another neighbor, he would come and sow tares in someone else's field. And in India, it says... Uh, Different weeds are sown that take years to get rid of. So Jesus, when Jesus told this parable, people knew what he was talking about in that day. And he told this and two more in public. Uh, that, that was the mustard seed and the, and the leaven. But we're going to jump down to verse 36 because in verse 36, he, he starts explaining what this tares parable meant. So I thought before we jump into those other two, let's go straight to what the tares mean because we just read about them. Verse, and let's hear what Jesus, how Jesus explains it. Verse 36, Then Jesus went to the, sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Who is that? Jesus. And the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So he explains it so clear. You really don't have to uh, try to uh, sensationalize it or think of it as metaphors. It's cut and dry right there. Verse 40, and there, as therefore the tares uh, are gathered and burned in the fire, and so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath, who hath ears, let him hear. So even though he explained it, he told them if you have, who have, he's talking privately right now here to his disciples, and he's telling them if you have an ear, really listen. You know, because a lot of people just get caught up in just this day-to-day -day life not realizing about eternity. And he's trying to let them know, hey, I know that I'm, I'm preaching all these good things, but there's an enemy out there. And he wants to come in to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And one way that he does that is he plants imitation believers right in the middle of the church. There's, the Bible talks about wolves in sheep's clothing, right? So it's important that we learn that God has, wants us to recognize that deception does come. In his explanation of the parable of the tares, Jesus reveals that he is the one that sows the good seed in his field. The world is the field. And we, I'm, I'm making a point of that because in some of these other parables, he goes back and refers to the field. He refers to different things. So uh, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom of heaven, and the, ta the tares are the children of the wicked one sown by the devil. So sowing tares is a, is a picture of Satan's effort to deceive the church by mingling his children with God's. How many of us know that's true? I mean, we may have, if you've been born again any length of time, you may have in, encountered people that you know you thought they were true believers and then something happened, they manifest is the way I say it. <laughs> and you realize they weren't what they claimed to be. And uh, we got tucked by that early on in our life as a believer. We, you know, this, we had went to this little tiny church and um, this one person came through and they said that they, they, some people show up at a church only to get business from the church people, you know, and he wanted to do like a paint job at our house or something and he, and he uh, took the money or didn't do it right like he said and then they just walk away. True believers will keep their word. They won't, they won't take advantage of the flock. I try to keep this place a safe place, but I can just do so much. If I don't know what's going on, if, I don't, if I'm not told, you know, there are people that will go by and they'll, they'll tap on, on people that look like they would be, because our people here are so kind and so generous. And we want to stay that way. And, and I, and, uh, but there are people that will take advantage of that. So we need to be wise and recognize that the enemy does come in to to try to rob from the church people. So we gotta, we gotta smarten up, amen? amen? But this imitation and deception by the tares that, that the enemy plops in is so convincing, it's difficult for many believers to discern between the imitation and the real children of God. That's why we have to rely upon the Holy Spirit and don't just assume. You know, how often has I, have I had a thought and I said, oh, oh, that couldn't be, I could I, Surely that couldn't be. And I just pushed it away. And then a month later, a year later, it, it, I, I, was, I should have followed that, which was the Holy Spirit. Uh, but, you know, it's, sometimes it's, you don't want to be judgmental, so you question yourself. But you recognize, I want you to recognize that just the reason just as Jesus told this parable is because it's a real thing. The enemy does come in, and he comes in in subtle ways, in certain ways, and he imitates so this parable of Jesus was given to open the eyes of true believers to the tactics of the devil to deceive God's children. And, you know, if you want to just think about one example, in the book of Acts, how, how um, Ananias and Sapphira wanted to get, impress people, and they, 
they, they, they just went about to deceive and they lost their life because of it. All of us know the story of them, how they, people were giving property to the church and they were being led to do that. And they didn't have to. Nobody asked them to do it. But Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira wanted to look good for the crowd, I guess. And so they pretended and they hashed up a plot between themselves and they brought in deception into the church for the wrong motive. They didn't have to give it. He says, it was yours. You sold it. You could have kept the whole thing. But, and you could have, even the amount you gave, you should have, could have just been honest about it. But because their hearts were not right and they were decept- deceivers, uh, they suffered the consequence. That was the early days of the church. I don't, I can't, uh, I'm not going to try to explain it. Nobody wants any Ananias and Sapphira days in the house. But it's a good warning. <laughs> it's a pretty good warning. <laughs> I mean, don't, we all, Jesse and I have often said, we heard this years ago, we say, there's the four G's. You don't touch the four G's, especially in the ministry. You don't touch the glory. You don't touch the girls. And you don't touch the gold. And now you got to say you don't touch the guys. Anyway. Crazy things are going on in the church. There's a lot of people that are attracted to a church that looks like it's moving and going and don't really pay attention to what's said across the platform. And there's a lot of blasphemy that goes out, a lot of deception that goes out. So we have to be sharp. And we try to guard the place. If you have to see that I bring someone on the pulpit uh, here, it's because we've, they're proven and we've seen their lives, not saying everybody, everything everybody says is perfect. I'm not even saying, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I've messed it once in a while. I remember I go back and listen to my message. I said, oh, did, why did I say that wrong? You know, I've said like, called it Moses when it was Noah or, you know, some of that's just honest mistakes. It's not purposely trying to mislead or deceive people. There's a difference, right? I hear a lot of people do that as well that's been out there a lot longer than me and when I hear it, it makes me feel good. <laughs> I'm not lying, it's true. I said, oh, it's not so bad. I'm not the only one. You know, I have to learn to not be so hard on myself because I'm always constantly self-editing. Uh, but it's, uh, it's okay. It's okay. But in these last days, he's talking about they're going to, the angels, Jesus said at the end of the time, he's going to separate those tares and the wheat. Because sometimes when, even when you recognize a tear, there's a way to go about it. If let the Holy Ghost do what he does. We're not, that's not always our responsibility. As leaders, there will be times that that has to happen. And that happened, we saw how that happened in the, in the early church as well. But um, that's not something you want to do without the leading of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. But overall, he said, the ho- and he's going to give his angels um, that responsibility. And at that point, that's when he said, the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So that's our destiny. Amen? To shine for him. Yes. And in the middle of it, right now, though sometimes the church is not perfect. Sometimes there's a few weeds here and there, tears. Um, and, but we, we, uh, we work together and hopefully they can recover themselves. Amen? Let's go back to verse 31 and see this mustard seed, parable number three. I don't know if we'll have time to go into all of that. It's already 827. What do y'all think? Save it? Probably should save it next week. It's so good. But both mustard seed and the leaven are really connected to the tares, so we'll, we'll go in more detail about that to show you how they're connected. But this is so important to know that God, uh, Jesus wanted to teach us to be wise, to recognize that we're, we're in the world and this pure message of the gospel is under attack. Yes. And he will, he will do, the Satan will do what he can to come in to divide and subtract. Yes. But God has a plan to, to strengthen us and multiply us and build us up. And we see what happened when, G- when the church was born. The church was so powerful when it was born in that upper room and, and the Spirit of God came in there. And, 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 the Spirit, and when you stay close to God, he's able to reveal things to you that you need to know. There were times when Peter walked the street and this one person was following him. And, and the, I don't know if it was Peter or Paul, but it was following this. These people have a message of salvation saying things that seem to be good. And then all of a sudden, and he says, shut up. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing that. 
and this was a sorcerer or somebody that was doing fortune telling and she, he rebuked the devil out of her and she was set free. She was being motivated by a spirit. So that was, that was a tear that was planted, tried to get planted in the church of that day. There was Simon the sorcerer who followed Philip around. And when they came and brought the Holy Spirit and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, he wanted to pay for it so he can have that gift to, to do as well. And then he was attacked. He was put in his place. So I'm just saying that, there, and, and, and it was exposed at that point and, and, and revealed. So there are going to be, t- we have to be sharp and listen to the Holy Spirit. Because when the Spirit of God is moving in power in the way that I believe that God wants to do in these last days, there's going to be manifestations of his glory and the enemy is not going to like it. So we have to recognize that every, t- every time, in fact, you look back and you think about all the great miracles or the great revival stories that you've heard, how they were so powerful and going strong, and then something came in and messed them up. Yeah. Generally, it was pride or some kind of competition or some kind of craziness. And, and then it, and it you know, it, it's nice. Uh, it would be nice if it could end in a nice way, but sometimes it, there was a split or something that happened. But that's because the enemy comes in to plant and deceive. So we have to be sharp, especially during these last days. And we can, we can hear from heaven, amen? Yes. We can be wise. And we're not going to be caught up in things that are, that are off of the word. We're going to stay true to the word of God, continue to put him first. And we can have a confidence and an assurance that if we continually, and I'm going to go back to my little sermon about keeping a clean heart, if you keep your heart clean before God, because that's really what the parable of the sower was all about the condition of your heart. And nobody's responsible for that but you. You determine what you put in your heart, what you take time to keep out of your heart, what you decide, I'm not going to put that in front of my face because I know that's going to affect my heart. I know I'm not going to listen to that gossip or that attack because I know it's going to affect my heart. I know I'm going to put sermons and preaching in my ears because I know it's going to build up my heart because I have something I'm working on. You know, if you have goals and plans in your life, things you want to accomplish and you want to see done, you're going to do those things that make sure that you get stronger and you're able to see that result. Amen. So I'm responsible for the condition of my heart. You're the, responsible for yours as well. And so when you guard your heart, then that means that you're going to examine it. You're going to be daily when you're the word of God, Lord. Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. That's Psalm 19, 14, I believe it is. But it's the end of that, that beautiful Psalm 19, which talks about how the word of God is perfect, reviving or converting the soul. It is beautiful, it's perfect, it's complete. So the word of God is the only thing that'll keep us on track, keep our hearts pure before him. So examining your heart, eliminating things that are not pleasing to him, that's not productive to your life. That's not going to produce that hundredfold result. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and then enforcing what you know. Enforce the word of God in your life. Put the word of God in your heart. Keep it in front of your eyes. Let the med- he says, if you'll, Jesus, God told Joshua, if you will meditate in the word day and night, you know, he says, on my word, he says, then you're going to have good success. You're going to prosper in everything that you do. So it's our responsibility to do it. And if you're a householder, then you're going to say, as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Like Ron was saying, they made that decision to dedicate themselves to the Lord. And they were determined to do it. And what was the last D? They were determined. They they decided to do it. They were dedicated. They were disciplined. And they were determined. I listened. Hallelujah. Bow your heads. Father, we're so thankful for your word tonight. Lord, it's so rich. Lord, I thank you that you're, you're revealing to us the truths that we need today. Lord, I thank you that because of you, we can come boldly to the, to the throne of grace Because of the blood of Jesus, because of what you did on the cross, we can come boldly to God's presence and receive everything we need anytime. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the throne of grace that's open right now. And Lord, we come to you and we say, Lord, we repent of anything that we've done or said or thought about that has been uh, unproductive, that's not been pleasing to you. Lord, we pray for you to cleanse us and 
reveal it to us, Lord, ways that we can grow stronger in you. Lord, we want our hearts to be pure before you so there will be no hindrances, that your strength and your power can flow in and through us, Lord, to accomplish your will and your plan in this world through our lives and through our families, through this church. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray for Wednesday night services. I pray for people to come in, for it to grow. Lord, because this is a place where people can, can receive the bread of life. They can receive the word of God and strengthen their souls. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for hungry hearts that are here tonight that are being fed your word. Their spirits are growing. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, and I thank you for miracles in this place. Lord, even the moment people walk through the doors, Lord, they'll experience the presence and the power of God. Lord, that they'll, their, their spirits will be ignited. Hallelujah. Let that new hope will rise within them to believe for the good plan that you have for their life. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for towers of strength in this place. Lord, that you're raising up pillars, Lord, in the church that are strong for you. And Lord, we thank you for it. And Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We pray for all the families that have been affected by so many different things that have been going on. Cecile's family, Lord, for the Weber's family, Lord, all of these people that are things, others that I know that, that have, are, are dealing with challenges and transition. Lord, we're, ours if we're determined to keep our eyes fixed on you and your promise and your word that, Lord, one day we'll all be united together with you and that we should not uh, walk in disappointment as others would because we have hope. We have strong comfort, Lord, because we know that we'll be all connected and united together with you one day. Hallelujah, I pray for supernatural strength and peace to flood this house. Lord, I think that this will be a, a refuge station, a station of hope, a, place, a station of a place that brings peace and strength. Lord, that your presence would just permeate the walls because of the prayer and the, and the intercession and the, and the great love that's, that's been poured out in this place. Lord, I thank you that it lives within us, but Lord, it's also recognizable for those that come through the doors, come through the gates. Lord, we thank you. We give you honor and praise in this place. Lord, if there's anybody here at all that's sick in their body in any way, Lord, I speak the word of God over them. Lord, I command the healing power to flow through this place from the front to the back, all the way side to side. Lord, restore everything. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done in Daryl, Lord, what you're continuing to do. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for the all the miracles that I see in this place. Hallelujah. Miracles that's already happened. Those that are even at work even now. Hallelujah. And those that are to come. We declare it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a great shout in the house. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.